Olá, daqui a Margarida do Fumaça. Em meados do século XX, delegados de Estados e reinos europeus e organizações de caridade organizaram duas conferências internacionais particularmente importantes. Sentaram-se em Genebra, na Suíça, e definiram os princípios de imparcialidade e neutralidade dos cuidados médicos em contexto de guerra ou catástrofe. A ideia de que a ação médica é prestada de igual forma, independentemente de quem é a vítima. Os conceitos foram evoluindo. Em 1965, tornaram-se dois dos princípios humanitários da Cruz Vermelha e do Crescente Vermelho. Em 91, foram também adotados pelas Nações Unidas. E hoje, constituem-se como duas das principais linhas orientadoras de grande parte dos financiadores e grandes organizações não-governamentais que prestam ajuda humanitária. Neutralidade, no entanto, passou a ser entendida como mais do que um conceito que se aplica à ação de médicos em tempos de guerra. Passou a ser uma ação institucional de não escolher lados em hostilidades ou tomar partido em controvérsias de natureza política, racial, religiosa ou ideológica. E é aqui que surgem os problemas. Quando estamos a falar de dois lados equivalentes, dois exércitos de dois estados em guerra, o princípio da neutralidade permite ao trabalhador humanitário cuidar de ambos. Quando estamos a falar de conflitos assimétricos, explica o escritor e trabalhador humanitário Salim Haddad, de genocídio, de apartheid, fica tudo um pouco mais complicado. Salim Haddad é palestiniano, de descendência libanesa, iraquiana e alemã. Trabalhou com organizações internacionais humanitárias um pouco por todo o Médio Oriente, entre as quais a gigante Médicos Sem Fronteiras. Esta entrevista faz parte da investigação que a jornalista Rafaela Cortes tem vindo a fazer com o Fumaça sobre ajuda internacional à Palestina. O que Salim Haddad demonstra, como já nos tinham dito vários outros trabalhadores humanitários, é que o problema é maior do que a Palestina. Nesta entrevista falamos sobre neutralidade no contexto da chamada Guerra Global contra o Terror e também sobre neocolonialismo, as consequências do atual modelo de financiamento e ideias de modelos alternativos. Gravamos com Salim Haddad no verão de 2023, meses antes da intensificação do massacre israelita em Gaza, que decorre desde o passado outubro. Can you talk about your humanitarian experience before and also now as a consultant? Mm -hmm. I used to work for Médecins Sans Frontières as a humanitarian advisor, and I worked mainly on their Muslim countries. That's what they categorized mm -hmm. it as. This was in the context of the global war on terror, and they had a lot of problems with negotiating access and acceptance by populations. So they wanted someone to come in as a researcher to try and understand how to articulate international humanitarian principles to a Muslim audience that was very skeptical of these principles. And they were skeptical of these principles primarily because of the increasing integration of humanitarian and political mm -hmm. strategy. So I worked in Yemen and Iraq and Syria, and I worked on Somalia and Pakistan and a little bit on Afghanistan as well. And then I became quite frustrated with humanitarian work and especially the neutrality element of humanitarian work as someone who is from the region. So... In 2010, and especially in 2011, when the revolutions happened, I felt that my role was better positioned as someone who was more political. Mm -hmm. And so I joined a conflict prevention organization, which allowed me to do more political work. So I worked a lot on Yemen and Egypt and Libya and Syria, and specifically Syrian refugees in mm -hmm. Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. And... I also worked with youth groups, youth activist groups and women's rights movements across the region to try and involve them in the political process. Mm -hmm. And being from the region, what does it mean to be neutral? What toll did they had on you to, to fulfill that role that it's some, so many times asked from humanitarian workers? So when I was working with MSF, MSF very strongly follows the principles of humanitarian activism mm -hmm. or humanitarian action, neutrality, impartiality, independence. But for me, there is a real question around why these principles exist. To what purpose do they serve? Are they important as ethical principles more broadly, or do they serve a strategic function? And I think when they were created, 
they were fundamentally a strategic function because they allowed access for humanitarian workers. When you have a conflict between two equal sides, mm -hmm. saying that you are neutral allows you to access areas where humanitarian aid is needed and deliver aid to all yeah. on both sides. Mm -hmm. This becomes more complex when you have an asymmetrical conflict, when you have a very powerful side versus a not powerful community or non-state actor. As someone who was from the Middle East and working in humanitarian action during the time after 9-11, I think the question of neutrality became very difficult for me to accept. And I think a big part of that is because there was this implicit assumption that humanitarian work itself was a neutral act. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that it's not a neutral act when you look at where the money is coming from and who's making the decisions when it comes to humanitarian action. After 9-11, there was an increasing integration between the humanitarian work and the military and political goals. And when funders started to do that, you could also see traditional humanitarian programming, whether it's water and sanitation or education, having a war on terror slant to it. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to do education programming for refugees, Syrian refugees in Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon, a donor would ask you to frame it in the context of de-radicalization. Okay. So how can you include de-radicalization in the curriculum mm -hmm. of the education that you're providing to refugee children? That to me is not a neutral act. Suddenly you're becoming a, a part of this wider conflict that's taking yeah. place and there's no space to question it under the guise of neutrality. Mm -hmm. And you will never have a program to uh, strengthen the resistance, for instance, because there would never be something that a country from Europe would support. Um, for sure. And if if we were to go back again to the question of neutrality and if it's about access and if only one side of the conflict mm -hmm. the really powerful side is the one that can guarantee or remove access then by its very nature when you are delivering humanitarian aid you in order to gain access you need to ensure that you're do your whatever you're delivering whatever programs you're delivering on the ground will not challenge the power structures that are in place mm -hmm. and so in a context like Palestine for example there there is a real question about what So, so long as you're being guaranteed access by this very strong oppressive power, to what degree is your programming only continuing mm -hmm. and becoming a technical management of... Of the status quo. Yeah. yeah, of the status quo, of ethnic cleansing, of genocide, and this goes more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, Did you thought about it when you were working? That's one of the reasons that also frustrated you about MSF or other organizations. Did you sense that this discussion was being brought to meetings or with your fellow workers? Did you talk about this? There was a lot of resistance to having this conversation in some quarters, especially when it was brought forward by what was perceived as people who are local to the area. Yeah. Because... You know, there's a huge power imbalance, especially in humanitarian work between local actors mm -hmm. uh, and local work, humanitarian workers and international humanitarian workers, not just in terms of where funds are allocated and who designs the programming and who makes these big decisions, but also in terms of how you are perceived. Part of my job was to be, was to go and negotiate, whether it was with tribes in Yemen or with groups in Iraq, access to try mm -hmm. and make sure that I explain what MSF does in a language that people understand. And so... I was basically used as an acceptance tool. But at the same time, given that I was from the region, my neutrality or my ability to be neutral was always called into question. Yeah. And it was often used as an excuse to lessen your decision-making power mm -hmm. because, oh, you're from there, you have a stake in this conflict or you have a stake in this issue, so you can't be neutral, so you can't make a decision about where money mm -hmm. is spent and how programs are designed. Mm -hmm. Did you thought that you could access coordination roles or climb in the hierarchy of inside the organization? I think for speaking in a more general sense, mm -hmm. not for okay. me, because my role is, was slightly different. But in a more general sense, I think local humanitarian workers, whether working in a bigger international humanitarian agency or whether working within a local organization, are really limited in terms of their roles. A big part of it is the question of neutrality mm -hmm. and whether they can be trusted to behave in a way that abides by humanitarian principles. And oftentimes you see local aid workers who have been working in a prolonged context, 
like Yemen for 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. constantly having to respond to and uh, be managed by this continuously changing flow of sometimes quite inexperienced mm -hmm. foreign humanitarian aid workers yeah. who don't know much about the context, who are in, say, maybe their early 20s, don't have much experience, but they come in a coordination role. And so in practice, it often means that the local staff are managing these people who actually have more power, who are better paid, mm -hmm. and who are also um, safer because if if there's a security incident or a threat to the humanitarian NGO, the it's the foreign aid workers who are quickly helicoptered out and mm -hmm. the locals are there to, to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a question of decision making and power, but it's also a question of safety. But also a reason that it's many times brought up, for instance, from MSF to... The reasoning behind that is to protect also the local staff because they don't make decisions, at least on paper. Do you have like so-called expat to have that role to take on the burden of the decision that the way that person can leave, it's not there to to bear the consequences. Hmm. Do you understand this reasoning? It does. It's not backed up by facts. When you look at the statistics of the nationalities of the aid workers that have been killed in the last 30 years, most of them are local aid workers. And uh, when we're talking about who is at the front lines of delivery of aid, who is doing the face-to-face -face liaising with mm -hmm. militias, with non -state, broader non-state actors, with communities, it's local actors who are doing that because they have the context skills and they have the language skills. It's not the international staff. Mm -hmm. So you think it's a broken system the way some of these organizations operate? It's a completely broken system. And... For me, you know, I have, I've worked in this industry on and off for 16 years now. Mm -hmm. And MSF, which is really, you know, MSF is seen as the one of the purest humanitarian organizations. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is because they're funded by private donations rather than state donations. However, in my opinion, and my 16 years of experience, it is also the most racist colonial organization I've ever worked with in my life. By far. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. And there is a bit of a reckoning now that's happening yeah. because people like me who were working there and who saw a lot of the, the interactions are now speaking out about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been a bit of a shift, but I think it's important to keep speaking out about that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain a little bit more? Why do you say the, the organization is colonial and racist? It's, first of all, the, I think the structure of mm -hmm. the organization is extremely colonial and racist. Their headquarters remain in Europe and in a lot of the imperial capitals mm -hmm. of Europe as well. And the decisions on where, uh, on which of the headquarters works in which country has colonial ties. So for example, MSF Belgium works, it, it dominates the programming in the Congo, for yeah. example. So there's this colonial mm -hmm. history that is not often acknowledged, or if it is acknowledged, it's in a very basic superficial way. I think day-to-day -day interactions, there's just a lot of distinctions that are made between local staff and mm -hmm. international staff. And it takes a lot of work for a local staff member to graduate to become an international staff member. So mm -hmm. occasionally you'll meet a nurse who is from the Congo who is working in a place like Iraq. But that's very rare. There's this hierarchy between the European and American international workers and the local workers that are in mm -hmm. the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, leave, uh, leaving the country is the only way you can progress on your career. You have to be an expat somewhere else, uh, because inside you wouldn't have that opportunity of going up the, the scale. Talking about funding, what's the weight or the impact that you felt or feel that the funding model has on the humanitarian work in the field because i understand that msf is a little bit different MSF from other is different yeah because yeah. they are uh, structurally funded so mm -hmm. they don't rely on projects such as the red cross for mm -hmm. instance that mm -hmm. uh, works uh, with the uh, money allocated to certain projects. But did you had a sense that, I think this is going to be a bas really basic phrase yeah, I'm going to no, say, but sure. that the funding uh, structures the humanitarian work and funding decides where what work is done in the field. Yeah, so state foreign aid funding has always had implicit foreign policy goals. And in the past, this was at least officially not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. 
During the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, the line between military and humanitarian objectives was purposefully blurred. This was part of the winning hearts and minds approach. There's been, there was an increasing integration where humanitarian and development actors were seen as an essential component of the military strategy to win the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But this, of course, had knock-on effects to a lot of Muslim countries, whether Somalia or Pakistan. And what I saw as well was that there were many non-state actors in these areas that were fighting this war on terror, and they perceived humanitarian work and, in fact, humanitarian principles themselves mm -hmm. as Western values rather than universal values. In these days, I think the facade of this distinction between humanitarian assistance and foreign policy has been broadly gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. In the UK, for instance, the Department for International Development has now been completely integrated by the Foreign Office so that development and humanitarian objectives are basically part of the foreign uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. And this undoubtedly shapes humanitarian work. Uh, funding is not based on where the needs are, but rather where it is strategically best placed to invest mm -hmm. the needs. And you see this recently in the case of, of Ukraine. I work a lot on the Syrian refugee um, crisis in the region, so in Jordan and Lebanon. And we've seen funding completely dry up. Mm -hmm despite the fact that the needs are still there and growing even more. But funding has completely dried up following the Russian invasion of Ukraine because now it's more strategic to invest in to invest your humanitarian aid in Ukraine rather than in Syria. Yeah. And do you think that also has the funding is shaped, so it's shaped in projects? Does that also has an impact on the work you do in the field? For instance, you were talking about mm -hmm. uh, Jordan and the uh, human women's rights in Jordan. And many times we spoke about with the Palestinian activists that also say this is this has put the activism and um, the humanitarian field into boxes. So you address maternal health care, you mm -hmm. address uh, human rights, you don't address the structural causes of it. Did you also had a sense of that? Yes, from my own work in the Middle East, we're seeing the international aid in industry contribute to the depoliticization and projectization mm -hmm. of revolutionary and political movements, whether during the Arab Spring with a lot of the revolutionary groups that came up or in a longer term perspective mm -hmm. with the women's rights movement in the Middle East. Um, you have these political movements that are turning either into NGOs or into organizations that are kind of delivering social care. Um, what happens is that the political work has been neutered mm -hmm. and the project of political change has been turned to technical delivery of social care, especially in the absence and retreat of the state. Mm -hmm. um, this often works to the benefits of everyone. It works to the benefits of the donors because you're having this depoliticized approach. It works to the benefits of the states who want to push these movements that might be threatening away from overtly political acts and towards more depoliticized projects. And this focus on technical approaches rather than a comprehensive political approach doesn't tackle structural inequalities. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually address the dynamics of power that contribute to continued injustice and dysfunctional systems. And I think it also contributes to competitiveness between movements. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the research that I've done on the women's movement in Jordan has really shown me that over time, the more that the women's movement become organizations reliant on foreign funding to operate, the more divided they become because they're competing for a smaller mm -hmm. chunk of money yeah. to be able to work and deliver their against care. Against each other. Exactly. Yeah. They're working against each other. It doesn't really contribute to cooperation. I think this is recognized as a problem among the Jordanian women's movement, but it's also very hard to address because once you become reliant mm -hmm. on foreign aid to function, then you are you, you. It becomes an existential crisis if you're not if you're not receiving foreign aid, then you n are no longer able to work, mm -hmm. and it contributes to a very short term thinking because organizations let's say the women's organizations in a place like Jordan, instead of thinking about long-term social change and what they want to achieve, mm 
um, they are thinking about how can we access this two to three year funding project mm -hmm. that is going to, for example, provide safe houses to women, which is a very important uh, okay. project, sure. But um, they're thinking in these short term funding cycles rather mm -hmm. than in this long term uh, political change um, mm -hmm. yeah. perspective. And this goes hand in hand with government restrictions at least across the Middle East and mm -hmm. North Africa, which is my area of specialty. But the projectization and depoliticization of these movements goes hand in hand with an increasing restriction on the space with which they can operate. So for example, the Jordanian government mm -hmm. has put forth increasingly stronger laws that restrict what NGOs can work on. So once you are designated an NGO, mm -hmm. you are therefore unable to do any work that could be seen as political. You are unable to criticize any politician. And uh, if you do those things, you can have your license taken away and that's mm -hmm. it in terms of your ability to work. You can't work. Yeah, you don't have access otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. Did you see a different model or do, do you see a different model of a humanitarian action to work with defined alternatives? So, I think, and this is a model that I propose when donors come to me and ask for alternative funding models. I think the most there there are two really important things. One is to fund without any restrictions. So fund long term and without any restrictions. Don't tell organizations where you can where you can invest programming, but give them the power to decide on where the needs are. Mm -hmm. and also contribute to their own long-term strategic thinking. And the second is provide opportunities with this money for networks of solidarity and cooperation, both within a country and more broadly. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what the humanitarian and development world needs to be aiming towards. And this is the only decolonial approach, is this idea where you are providing funds without any restrictions on the the length of time or the quality. Mm -hmm. There are all these arguments against it, but then you get into the colonial mentality because you say, oh, well, these organizations don't have the capacity to be able to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. But that's not true because these organizations live in the context. They are going to know what's best for them. And the work has always been political. Mm -hmm. So if you're choosing to fund these organizations, then you need to accept that your work is implicitly a political one. And then which side of the political coin are you falling on? Yeah, but have you felt in projects that you did that if this decision was made at a local level, it would totally be different, the focus of the project, for instance? So I think, I think for me, when one of the, when I was working in London, and so the policy was dictated primarily by the UK government, they were very interested in this buzzword called stabilization, hmm. and they're still interested in it. And when I was working during the Arab Spring revolutions, the question of stabilization was constantly brought up. And stabilization means basically to prevent conflict, but to keep things stable. Okay. Um, in a context of revolutionary change, Stabilization is actually a very counter-revolutionary argument because you're saying, I don't want this thing. I want the status quo to change. I want things to be stable. And when we, as an NGO, were writing proposals to try and get funding, we had to go through hoops to try and articulate why supporting mm -hmm. these revolutionary movements and why making sure that there were representatives of these movements on the negotiating table contributed to stabilization. So we yeah. would say in a very long-term view, if you are living in a democracy where there is equality and there is freedom of exp expression and there is women's rights, you will have a more peaceful society. Mm -hmm. But this does mean that there might be conflict in the short term at the expense of long-term peace and yeah. harmony. So we needed to make this argument. But it takes a lot of work to do that. And it is fundamentally a, a castrating tool because you always have to depoliticize yourself to try and justify your mm. political work. And I think that if the decision making was left to people on the ground, I think that it would be more progressive, more innovative, and I think more sophisticated because you wouldn't have these 
broad agendas that are set yeah. forth by countries like the United Kingdom or the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. And more direct to the revolution and the resistance. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it wouldn't have the phrase of revolution is go not going to be funded <laughs> exactly. or not going to be subsidized. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Esta entrevista foi preparada por mim, Margarida David Cardoso. O texto da introdução é da Rafaela Cortes. O Bernardo Afonso fez a edição de som e de texto. Fazem ainda parte da equipa Fumaça, Fred Rocha, Joana Teresa Batista, Lucas Grimaud de Freitas, Luís Marquês, Maria Almeida, Nuno Viegas e Ricardo Seves Ribeiro. Pode juntar-te à comunidade de 1.800 pessoas que mensalmente apoiam o nosso trabalho e garante que esta redação continue a existir. Sabe mais em fumaca.pt barra contribuir. Até já. Música